Good morning from the Nature and Wildlife Discovery Center. Um, my name is Diana and this handsome fellow next to me, this is Theo. We are so excited um, to be live with you today. We're missing our visitors here at the Nature and Wildlife Discovery Center. I know while we're kind of physically separated from each other, we thought we might socially connect and let you know what's happening at our Raptor Center. So today for our Saturday weekend Raptor Talk, this is Theo and I'm gonna visit with you all about him today. Theo is an adult peregrine falcon, and we do have a little bit <laughs> of a uh, audience behind us, Ruby, our red tail. She's probably going to have commentary. It's spring, and her hormones are crazy, so she's going to visit with us as well. But anyway, <laughs> as a peregrine, Theo is, of course, an amazing bird of prey, and that's what our job is at the Raptor Center, taking care of birds of prey, eagles, hawks, owls, falcons, vultures, and the like. And our job is to try to help them recover from injuries that they receive. This time of year, we see a lot of birds coming through with injuries from migration, but with the slowdown of traffic from people staying at home due to the COVID-19 COVID, COVID um, epidemic, um, they're having a little bit easier time. So fortunately for us, even though we're busy working every day, our population is not increasing um, with too many new residents. So we're happy about that. And of course we do when we can try to help these birds recover and go back to the wild. That's our ultimate goal. But that doesn't always happen for every bird. Um, sometimes there's very serious injuries. And when you think about things that happen to them, Theo's a little nervous about being live on TV, on Facebook, I think. But anyhow, um, they get hit by cars, they get, zapped on power lines, they get tangled in barbed wire fences, so hit windows. So many of these are very traumatic injuries and they don't all survive, but occasionally they do survive their injuries. But because of the severity of the injury, the bird is left with a physical disability or handicap, if you will. And that's what's going on with Theo. He was um, brought to us. He's been with us now for seven years. Theo came in in the fall um, his, as a youngster, his first migration. We don't know what happened to Theo, but he did have an accident. And so people found him in their pasture in over by Canyon City. And they called us and we sent out a, a volunteer rescue team to pick him up from the field and they brought him back and we discovered that Theo had hit something very hard and fractured his ulna bone and that's pretty much the same bone that you and I have in our forearm. We have an ulna and a radius in our arm and birds have an ulna and radius in their wing. The radius was intact which is a good thing because it can kind of act as a splint <laughs> for the very nervous Theo um, while the bone is healing except for Theo's ulna was literally shattered. It was in about six different pieces and that's a significant injury. Now our veterinarian did a great job of doing some surgery and um, threading all those little bone fragments onto a wire or actually a steel pin in that went through the bone and we allowed that to heal and it took several months to repair. But be, and it did heal and it, it did a pretty good job. However, with that much damage to the bone, there's no way Theo could ever fly the way that he needs to. And of course, for birds of prey, flight is very important because it's how they pursue prey. Birds of prey, of course, eat animals and peregrines. They love to eat a variety of animals. Their favorite are birds. They'll hunt a lot of different types of birds from something the size of a quail all the way up to and including one of their favorite foods, which is ducks. Believe it or not, this little guy who only weighs a little over a pound hunts ducks. So it's pretty phenomenal, his skills. So flight for them is significant. But of course, before he can ever think about flying after the duck, he has to find it. So birds of prey are well known for their vision. Now, depending on whether they're a daytime or nighttime animal, um, their eyes a little bit different. So in a falcon or an eagle or a hawk, their eyes are very large, which is true of all birds of prey. Their eyes are huge. In fact, sometimes their eyeballs are so massive for their magnificent sight that they literally take up a third of the space of the skull. So for you and I, if I had eyeballs like Theo, which would be, in his case, engineered for long distance vision, he sees anywhere from two to four times the distance that we can. So if my eyes were engineered like Theo's, I literally right now would be, have to look at you with eyes the size of tennis balls in my head. So I'd be pretty funny looking. 
but that's what his eyes are like. So they are just amazing visuals. So Theo would sit and peregrines like to, to sit up high. And most, that's true of most birds of prey. When you drive down the highway, where do you see the birds? Up on the power poles, up in trees, on the lines, they like to be high. Or if it's a hawk or an eagle, they're soaring overhead using height as their vantage point to see their prey. So Theo being a peregrine, they love um, cliff kind of habitat. So you'll find them in canyon areas. They have made their homes now in urban areas, especially cities on the t sides of tall buildings. So these guys have adapted very well to life alongside of humans. Wasn't always that way, but Theo would be sitting there cliffside scanning or maybe flying, who knows, but searching for food. And let's say he spies a pigeon and maybe that pigeon is a half a mile away. No problem for him. <laughs> he can spy it and then he's gonna have to take flight after it. So to help him do that, you've probably been noticing as he's flapping next to me, he makes a lot of noise when he flies and trust me, he moves the air. I often, when I have people live in front of me, <laughs> when Theo start flapping their wings, they comment how they can feel the air moving from his flap. So his wings are engineered for flapping and high speeds. So he could take out flapping after that little pigeon below him and just by flapping he can reach speeds easily 40 miles an hour so he's a pretty quick little guy but peregrines and other birds of prey that hunt in a day also have the strategy of using high speed dives to chase their food so theo he might be up above that pigeon a couple hundred feet and instead of just trying to flap after it which takes a lot of energy he can use the shape of his body and if you look at Theo if he'll cooperate a little bit <laughs> he has an omega body his body is very streamlined and thin his wings are long and they come to a point we call <laughs> his wing shape is tapered so it is totally engineered for high speed so when he is up above his prey a couple hundred feet he'll look down and let his little brain do the math, how far, how fast do I need to go? And then he literally goes into a dive head first. He'll pull in his wings to help him get up speed. In fact, actually he has different positioning for his wings depending on what stage of a dive he's in. But as he dives through the air, he can reach some pretty amazing speeds. A red tail um, flapping can easily reach speeds 80 miles an hour plus in a dive. Golden eagles have been clocked coming in at prey at 120. And peregrine falcons, they're believed to be the fastest birds on the planet, maybe the fastest thing on the planet, we don't know for sure. But in a dive, peregrines can actually reach speeds of more than 200 miles an hour. Um, one recent study showed <laughs> that um, someone clocked a peregrine in a dive going, whoops, oops, oops, let me help you, buddy, <laughs> going 277 miles an hour. <laughs> I can't imagine, you know, stopping at 277 miles an hour, much less breathing. So in that dive, to help him with all that speed and air rushing at his face, birds of prey actually have um, the day active ones. They have in their nasal openings, or their nares, as we call them, they actually have structures to slow the air down, racing down their trachea into their lungs. So this part is pretty cool so that he can control that air going in so it doesn't rush to his lungs and blow him up. So he's diving down 200 miles an hour as he gets close to the prey. One of the last things that you'll see just before they strike is the wings open out and that's to help slow them down so that they can get to that prey and do what they do best and that is capture it and that's with their feet. Now we may have to make a choice. His feet of course as all birds of prey their feet are very large, they're very powerful and they're engineered for grip and depending on the bird of prey the grip is different. Falcons and uh, uh, peregrines, the last time I read a book um, giving me some numbers on peregrine grip he has about maybe 80 80 to 90 pounds of pressure per square inch in his grip and that's a lot of power that's actually as strong as my hand so this little foot is just as powerful as my hand so that's pretty amazing in a bird that he has that kind of engineering so if it's something small he might grab it um, with his foot maybe he's d diving on a pigeon or a dove something small and lighter than he is he might grab it and fly with it or if it's something big like a duck instead he may just strike it in midair and stun it or wound it so that the animal will fall to the earth. So he uses his feet to catch and kill his prey. So let's say he hits that dove or that pigeon and he doesn't grab it, he hits it and the dove, it falls to the earth. So down he follows it, 
keeping an eye on it at all times. In fact, if you ever get to watch a video of these guys, they kind of don't just come straight. They kind of spiral in and spiral down so that they always have one eye on their prey so that they don't lose it. And as he gets there, of course, when he gets to the ground with the prey, he's going to check it out, make sure that it's deceased. If it's not, it's a little gruesome, but he'll finish it off. He can use his feet to do that, but sometimes on a big bird, it's hard for the feet to actually get deep enough to, to kill the duck where he needs to if he's catching a duck. So he may need another tool for that. And that's where Falcon's beak come in. So we're gonna to try to take a close up here of Theo's little beak. There you go. I don't know if you can see it or not, but on Theo's little beak, he has a tooth, kind of a, if you look right where his beak hooks, because raptors of course have that hook beak, you'll notice He's just being hard-headed and not looking at you, but you'll notice that there's like a little tooth there that's called a tomial tooth, and that is a specialized tool that helps falcons to actually kill their prey by biting down on the spine and severing the spinal cord. So he's got this extra tool that helps him to kill prey that he might not be able to do with his feet. So of course, once you've done that, you get to eat. <laughs> and that's what the whole goal is, of course, to find your food and eat it so that you can survive another day. Well, Theo here at the Raptor Center, he's been with us now for seven years, as I mentioned earlier, and I have to tell you, he's one of our favorite birds. <laughs> Everyone loves Theo. He's usually very calm. Today, he's just a little bit insane. I'm not sure what's happening with him, but he is, of course, as any educational animal should be, spoiled rotten. And one thing that people really don't know about Theo, so I'm going to like blow his image for you right now. People think of him as this big, beautiful, noble raptor, which he is, but he does have a very soft side to him. And it we found that side out a few winters ago. Um, Theo, because he's a migratory bird, he wouldn't live in our area in the winter time. So Theo is quite pampered. So he has an indoor outdoor enclosure here at the center. So on cold nights, he can go inside and relax. Well, we had a real severe week of bitter cold winter weather one December and Theo was inside and I have to tell you he and of course our vultures which I'm gonna Lurch will be tomorrow's guest on our weekend raptor talk just to kind of hype it up a little bit but Lurch and Theo both in their indoor enclosures were bored and some kind of person had donated to us um, a bunch of pillows and I thought okay these guys need something to do they need some enrichment and they were just the fiber fill pillow so I thought well they'll make a mess but it'll be easy to clean up so I gave them both a pillow and I walked away to finish up my job <laughs> I came back a little bit later just to see what fun they were having and true yeah vultures had shredded the pillow and I had polyfill everywhere and they were having a great time I peeked in at Theo Theo had not torn up his pillow in fact he was lying on it sleeping on the pillow and from that day forward he sleeps in the evening on a pillow it's hysterical and i will post this week a picture later on facebook of theo sleeping on his pillow so here's this big tough raptor who sleeps on a pillow so don't tell me he's spoiled he is he is very spoiled rotten well peregrines also for many of you probably already are aware of it were once an endangered species in some areas, they are still threatened, but federally, they are no longer on the threatened or endangered list, and that's exciting. In, of course, the um, 40s and 50s, we introduced a pesticide called DDT, and that had very detrimental effects for lots of animals, especially birds. Big birds like bald eagles and osprey and peregrines were highly affected. What the chemical did is in their body, and DDT tends to stay, it builds up in the fat reserves of an animal. So as it gets through the food chain, instead of the DDT, you know, the insect dies and somebody eats it, like a songbird eats it, and then the peregrine eats a songbird, and the DDT just goes up the food chain that way. So in a female peregrine, she would be building up DDT in her fat reserves. And then when she goes into egg laying mode in the springtime, she burns a lot of that fat reserve for egg production. And it would release that DDT into her bloodstream. And I don't know what all the chemistry is involved, but what it does is it affects the ability of the bird to lay an egg with a proper shell on it. So and this happened to lots of birds. So effectively for many years, these birds weren't able to produce young and of course anytime you eliminate young from the population they're going to drop it's going to drop quickly especially in a peregrine these guys only live in the wild 10 years or so so if you don't replace yourself within 10 years it's just your population is going to vanish 
but thanks to a lot of people paying attention. Okay, whoa. <laughs> and doing a lot of hard work with habitat protection, um, lots of studies and um, captive breeding and reintroduction programs, peregrines, bald eagles, ospreys, they're all back doing well, thriving once again in North America. So we're very, very happy to have them. Well, here at the Raptor Center, we're doing well. Um, we're of course practicing our social distancing. We're kind of down to a skeleton crew and we are missing you. We're hoping that you will all be safe and well and hopefully in the next few weeks, we'll be able to see you guys up close and personal. Um, Theo and I are gonna say farewell for now and hope that maybe you'll join us tomorrow, same time, um, to talk a little bit about Lurch. I'm gonna finish up my live video, but I will wander back to my computer in my office. So if any of you have any questions, be sure to post them on Facebook and I will be happy for the next half hour or so to stay online and visit with you. Thanks again for joining us here at the Nature and Wildlife Discovery Center. Again, we hope that you'll stay safe, be well, and we'll get to see you up close and personal very soon.